match this weekend is against Sogi. There is no double that I will win the match. 세 명의 생각이 다 똑같은 것 같은데 구름 예선만 통과하면은 하면 아마 우승할 수 있지 않을까 생각합니다. I'm pretty confident I'll win because I heard that he was called the Korean Ping Ping Ho. I don't think he's gonna be able to beat the original. I think the lineups I bring this week still represent Ping Ping Ho style pretty well. It actually used some of my deck building strategy which I designed like two years ago. 이거는 네개 덱이 거의 다 물고 물리는 상성이라서 벤을 어떻게 벤을 뭘 하고 픽을 어느 순서로 꺼내느냐 이게 제일 중요할 것 같아요. Uh, many people think that I'm special for playing shaman. The reason why I play shaman is because I want to have my personal style, and it will make people think, "Wow, this is Pingping Ho." Pingping Ho가 줄서 안 들고 갈것 같아서요. 그거는 제가 볼때 Pingping Ho의 스타일이랑 안 맞다고 보거든요. I think my past experience will certainly help me a little bit. 오히려 그런 쪽이 더 불리하지 않을까 생각하는데요. 그쪽이 더 정보가 많고 저는 상대적으로 정보가 없는 편이기 때문에 제가 좀더 어, 전략적으로 좀더 유리하게 갖고 갈수 있지 않을까 생각해 봅니다. I don't think, think he will be intimidated by that, but I'll beat him anyway. To all my opponents this weekend, I have to say sorry. Maybe you should try again. The original Pimping Ho coming out with lots of confidence and swagger as always. Welcome back, everybody. I'm TJ. This is Froden. It's been a while, man. I'm excited to cast again. It has. Uh, we, we chained TJ down to the sidebar because he was doing such a great job there. <laughs> For um, 10,000 years. <laughs> <laughs> Long ago, TJ used to cast, and today the beast has been unleashed. Welcome back to the desk, TJ. Uh, you know, I'm really happy to be able to cast. I'm really happy that we have this match coming up. Uh, I'm really excited for both of these players. One, because it's great to see familiar faces in a sea of newcomers, Ping Ping Ho being one of them, uh, but also because uh, Sogi is also one of the hyped players from Korea. We asked guys like Kranich, who people are familiar with, going to BlizzCon two years in a row. He says this guy is probably the favorite to win it all. Yeah, he said he's got a huge champion pool and coming out of a, a victory in OGN Masters in Korea in season four. So mm -hmm. uh, get on Twitter, though. Let us know who you guys think will win. You can tweet uh, with the hashtag HCT and vote for either hashtag PinPingHo or hashtag Sogi. Pimping Ho had a lot of, you know, choice words saying that he's the original Pimping Ho. And even though people call Sogi the Korean Pimping Ho, there's there's nobody that can that can match him. So uh, I'm I'm really looking forward to it. So get out there yeah. and, and vote for who you think is going to take it. I agree. Yeah. I think it's just funny that they acknowledge that they look kind of similar yeah. <laughs> uh, in that capacity. They have the same, but do they play the same, TJ? I think uh, I think there's some surprises in store because Peiping Ho promised something pretty interesting. And Sogi, he's the one that's the tried and true. He plays very methodical. Uh, he doesn't really make a lot of mistakes, or at least so they claim. Mm -hmm. This is one of the biggest stages that he's played in yet, and I can't wait to meet the players. All right, well, let's meet them indeed. The first player for the final match of the day, it is going to be Sogi. Sogi comes from Korea and plays on a team called Aggressive. Is that an indication of this type of decks he's going to bring? Not exactly sure, but hyped by other players, such as two-time BlizzCon finalist Kranich, yeah. saying he is the favorite, in his opinion, at the pool date to win it all. Yeah, definitely. Uh, he has a, a gigantic... Uh, deck pool, and he's played multiple archetypes across multiple classes uh, in, in a lot of his matches, and just in his OGN win. So uh, let's introduce his opponent. It is going to be Pinping Ho. Pinping Ho, the Shaman God. At least that's what he called himself just a few months ago when he was qualified from Asia Pacific yet again for BlizzCon. This guy is definitely one of the best in his region, and even acknowledges that even if he isn't the best, He'll still win. This guy has a confidence that you'll never see in a lot of other players. And not only that, he also has experience competing in other events like the ESL Legendary Series and making a splash there as well. The notorious P-I-N-G, as they call him on the streets of Taiwan. They don't. <laughs> no no one calls him no that. One calls that. I call him that. And I'm going to keep calling him that. Only one person in the history of the world has called him that, TJ. And it was me. It was you indeed. Yeah. You know, Ping Ping Ho comes in here as a, as a player that people expect something from, but I think uh, this might be one of the best 
technical matches that we'll see uh, throughout the entire weekend. You can definitely tell that a few of the players uh, are a little bit uncomfortable. I mean, mm -hmm. Navi, he was even telling me, man, he's like, dude, I'm so nervous. I'm not sure uh, what I'm going to do uh, yep. in the match. And, you know, it definitely felt like a little unfortunate for him based off the draws. But you can tell a guy like Ping Ping Hell, he's just used to this by now. And I think that's going to play a big factor going into the series. Yeah, and Sogi actually said in this interview, he said he thinks that the experience is actually a disadvantage because you get to see, you know, all of the the, the matches that he's ever played. So uh, let's take a look at the poll results from what you guys voted. And it looks like Pimping Home, he's, uh, he's taking the poll lead. He is, I'm man. I'm not surprised. The, the reality is Pimping Ho is actually uh, a very interesting character. I, I believe the chat really is fond of him just because he says really, he has great interviews. Yes. And he just kind of puts himself out there. It, it, you know what? He actually reminds me a lot of Trump in a way mm -hmm. of just uh, Trump, the player, of course, uh, yeah, the, from you know, Jeffrey. Thank Trudeau. you for clarifying. Yes, thank you. I just wanted to remind you of everybody of that fact. Uh, he reminds me of Trump of just like he's unabashedly himself and extremely confident about it, which makes him extremely charming as well. Yeah, uh, I love that. It's, it's super endearing. Yeah. And uh, he was saying that he didn't bring Shaman to this tournament because it, it's not that he, he only loves Shaman. It's that he just loves decks where he can put his own pimping ho flair on them, where he can make the, the pimping ho style come out in the deck. And he said he thinks he can do that with the decks that he brought to this tournament. So I'm really excited to see what kind of you know stuff he has in store with this deck lineup. And you can see Paladin Warlock Warrior are the decks that he's going to be playing this match with his Druid Band. Yeah, both sides, too. Soki yeah. is a player uh, who, you know, characteristically, he actually benefits a lot more once the metagame is figured out. He's mm -hmm. not necessarily an innovator. So what you're going to see is a player that tries to innovate, like Ping Ping Ho, go up against a person who masters uh, the, the standard way that you can play Hearthstone, the one that's the most optimized. So yeah. who's going to be able to be the win? Is it the creative artist or is it a person who's done one kick 10,000 times? Yeah, and right now is it, it seems like Sugi's environment, you know, because the meta's been, uh, even though it hasn't been stable, there's been a long time to figure out this meta. So we'll have to see. They've been able to, to sit and watch the Europe Championships, the Winter Championships, and the Americas Winter Championships, and you know, sort of take note from there. So I'm really excited to see how this matchup's going to play out. That's right. Similar lineups and apparently similar outfits. I mean, <laughs> these guys say it's a true mirror match, right. yeah. except for their country of origins. Let's go into game one. And already some differences. We see another Murloc Paladin. That is the second one of the day. Up against the Warlock, which has dark bombs, implying that it's a more defensive control style. Yeah, uh, it, it could be Demon Handlock, you know, traditional Handlock. Uh, we can rule out Reno Warlock because of the double dark bomb. If you do run... You sure, TJ? Uh, yes, I okay. am. Listen, I had there to might about be that some people, I don't know who out there, that have experimented running two uh, of cards in a list. Uh, however, it hasn't been that successful, and I completely agree. I think it might be a demon handlock. And what the heck is this, Dan? We've seen two Murloc Paladins already today. Yeah, Murloc Paladin's really interesting because... It has such lopsided matchups, very similar to Freeze Mage. Mm -hmm. Freeze Mage can sometimes dominate uh, an archetype really hard. Taking a look at Zoo, for example. Yeah. Um, but it also loses really hard to Control Warrior. In a similar fashion, Murloc Paladin also struggles against decks that can put on a lot of aggression against it very fast and mm -hmm. then push it out of the game so you can't heal it in time. For example, Druid. Uh, but if Sogi's going to be banning Druid, it feels like it opens up a much wider range of potential decks that he, he's favored against. Yeah, and it's a deck where you can come into a matchup if you're super confident in what you think the decks that your opponents uh, will bring are, then you could confidently bring Murloc Paladin. And you, you said earlier, Sogi's one of those people who, who really, you know, trusts in figuring out the meta and trusting in their, their self to know exactly uh, how the meta is. So uh, not surprised to see it. There's a couple different types of the Murloc Paladin. I think we're gonna we're gonna see the differences between Matsun's Murloc Paladin and Sogi's Murloc Paladin. Because Let this one looks to be a little bit more defensive and not quite as board centric like the shielded minibot version that we saw from Matsun. Yeah. Now there are some variations uh, within the Paladin TJ. Have you been able to play this deck at all? Like you uh, know yeah. the, the, yeah. the different variations of what people like to play? Yeah. Uh, there's some players that like to play with very strong curved out creatures like Shield Mini Bot, Mushroom for Battle, and Dr. Boom. Mm -hmm. There's some players. It's that, my personal favorite. Version. Yeah, and there's some players that like to play just straight up defensive, where you go complete cycle with Doomsayers early on and full heal package. Mm 
you know, double heal bot, double land hand, so. Yeah, even cards like Humility sometimes. Humility, yeah. Appearance. Yeah. Well, uh, this has been a little bit slow to start things off. I think both these players <laughs> take an opportunity to really milk in the time that they have now. Mm -hmm. uh, Sogi, again, uh, he's a player that will be playing a lot of the, the decks that is straightforward and refined, except that's what I was told. However, Murloc Paladin is not really that straightforward. Uh, the deck has a lot of small nuances, and it's very punishing if you make mistakes, uh, just because of the way decisions end up compounding on each other. If you use your AoE a little bit too early, like Quality Pyromancer, then all of a sudden you're going to be in big trouble if your opponent's been playing against it and they recognize it. Plus, now the secret is kind of out on both sides. Pipping Ho said, okay, you didn't play anything turn one, and then you play Loot Hoarder, so I know what you are. Yeah. More of a slower Paladin. Mm -hmm. So he's like, well, you didn't do anything but tap, so I feel like I know what kind of Warlock to expect. At least he knows that it's not a Zoo Warlock approach, which probably makes him a little bit happier because as the deck slows down, the more control, uh, Morlock Paladin gets better. Yeah, he still really can't pinpoint exactly what type of, of control style Warlock it is because he, you know, he hasn't seen anything. Uh, a lot of times, Reno Warlock will have more often than not plays to make before turn four, so you might be able to rule that out, especially after next turn. But mm -hmm. still nerve wracking. And you know, classically, this type of Paladin, if we look back all the way to like the ESGN days, which is uh, um, about the last time that. that we saw uh, two different control decks that were Warlock and Paladin. The Paladin had the advantage back then, but I don't think it's it's necessarily the case this time around. Well, I, I still think I lean towards the Paladin yeah, side. Yeah. One, one of the things that you have to just look at is a quality is the final say. No matter how big of a board that you build as Ping Ping Ho, yeah. you can build the world's biggest giants. Let's say hypothetically each giant was even like a 20-20. You can still equ quality them because uh, they need a turn to attack. Now, Ping Ping Ho, on the other hand, what does he have that really pushes it over the edge? It seems like some of these decks run Doom Guards as a way to burst, yep. but it's not its not like a Leroy Faceless Manipulator or an Arcane Golem Faceless Manipulator with Power Overwhelming buffs. Uh, those are the ways you can actually push the Paladin out of the game. If you just give the Paladin a lot of time, what it's gonna do is just, it's gonna play, it's gonna clear the board, clear the board, and then draw a ton of cards, and finally play anything can happen over two turns and you can't stop it. Sometimes you can't even stop it over one turn because unlike Control Warrior, which can hold on to the brawls and hold on to the sludge belters until the end of the game mm -hmm. when, anything's, when anything is played, uh, the Demon Handlock really just doesn't have tools. They, Unless they have a huge Shadow Flame, they can't really remove even just the Murlocs from the first anything can happen off the board. And the only defensive tools they have is, you know, a Sludge Belcher and potentially a Malganus, mm -hmm. which usually aren't enough to, like you said, block that second one. Pretty tough turn here from Soki. He has a lot of options. Four mana basically gives him full flexibility to address this. If he uses Alder Peacekeeper onto the, the dragon, or sorry, the uh, Twilight Drake, it actually does make it so that you can't silence it and then you would injure yourself. Yeah. However, you're playing off curve, and it doesn't feel exactly the best use of your mana, uh, considering that you, next turn you have even more access to cool plays with Old Murkai and uh, even the Bluegill Warrior. Yeah. And depending on how the board builds as well, getting the Choose Over Champion out now allows you to adjust the board even better the following turn. Yeah, and it's sort of the, the same deal with uh, a Control Warrior in this matchup, where you really have to be con super conservative with your removal. Because even though you do have a decent amount of removal, you, you, you still don't want to use it on, on you know these smaller amounts of creatures. So getting that Choose Over Champion early, start hitting away with it, not being afraid to take that damage early on in the game is sure. definitely the right the right course of action for this deck. Two Mortal Coils, allowing you to keep the, the Twilight Drake safe. I'm I'm down for that. I think one thing that Pimping Ho is considering, though, is does he end up using his mana to play, say, the Void Walker? Uh, sorry, the Void Caller. Uh, the Void Caller would pull out cards like Malganus, which early game pressure against this Paladin is actually very good if yeah. you're able to push it out. However, he also recognizes that he can get more mileage out of this Twilight Drake. So it's, it's a trade-off. What is he willing to do? Play the Void Caller, or is he going to play a little bit slower? Yeah, it's going to decide to sort of space out those threats, and maybe he doesn't want Malganus out this early, because he doesn't want uh, to put all of his eggs in the, that one basket, or put sure. all of his eggs on the one board. Yeah, basket, board, same difference, DJ. Indeed. Uh, Sogi, 
I mean, he has access to, to plays here. I think it wouldn't be bad to even um, attempt to draw cards after you use Blue Good Warrior to mm -hmm. kill into the Twilight uh, Drake. But then you also can develop the Accolade of Pain. Both of them are pretty valid. The, the goal is still pretty straightforward from Sogi. What he wants to do is just control the state of the board and trade your Murlocs and draw cards. If you can do those three things, you're in a really good spot. Yeah, and it, it seems like he, he's definitely getting uh, the good end uh, of his draw. Sometimes you can get stuck with the clunky cards in your hand early on. You want to draw your Murlocs before anything. You want to draw like your removals before your heals and your card draw before your heals. So uh, he, he definitely in a good spot. I'm sure Sogi's happy. And, you know, Pimping Hill, this, this matchup can be tough to navigate for the Demon Handlock just because you, you have to yeah. think so far in ahead. Every time you play a card, you have to think, is this a card that I'll need later on to deal with, you know, anything can happen or to make sure that I can kill my opponent before he plays anything can happen. So definitely a, a super tough matchup. It's sort of an uphill climb. I'm looking at Lothab being one of the key cards yeah. uh, of being able to shut that valve off at least for one turn. Uh, so we'll see if that ends up being the case here. Uh, Sogi, now that he sees Voidcaller, probably a little bit unhappy. He's like, well, I don't know if I should attack it. This is why Voidcaller is one of my favorite cards in the game, TJ, because there's so much tension on the board immediately. Yep. If I kill this Voidcaller, will something be brought out? And if so, can I even deal with it? Should I ignore the Void Caller because of this, or should I address it now so that way he can't pick up a good trade with it? Uh, very, very complex card, and I love it. Um, may it rest in peace. <laughs> Yeah, there's so many different. <laughs> uh, let's let's have a moment of silence. <laughs> not, not yet. Still, he's okay. very much alive. Yeah, yeah, but uh, definitely a great oh, no. uh, a great card. Peacekeeper allows you to draw multiple cards off this Acolyte of Pain. It's bringing me back quickly to the control styles. Of yeah, the it used to be a, a common strategy. You know, run that Acolyte of Pain with the Aldor Peacekeeper. Uh, it's such the ultimate synergy. Yep. Between those two cards. Yep. Uh, I like Sogi just taking his time here. He's not playing the Morlock Warrior just because he happened to draw it. When, when you're under rope pressure, you might feel like, oh, three mana, I drew a card, play yep. it. But he realizes that Murloc War Leader and Mur Old Murkai is a five damage removal spell. Mm -hmm. uh, sorry, not spell, but like a combination yep. you can attack with. And then um, you might even have an opportunity to remove a threat like the Ancient Watcher. Cards like Ancient Watcher still present a big of a logistical problem. It could be Shadow Flamed, it could be Taunted, and you have to get through it. And ultimately, you still want to control the state of the board, so you don't want that thing bullying people. Exactly, and a lot of times you don't want to push them too low, especially in this matchup. So sometimes when you don't have things to do, you might as well just kill that mm -hmm. that Ancient Watcher. So Sure. Well, uh, going back to Peeping Ho's hand, uh, how does he want to control the state of the board here? He's still a few turns away from feeling like his opponent can play anything. Mm -hmm. um, and so I feel like his hand probably is completely dependent if he wants to develop a low, um, not Lothab, sorry, the Sludge Belcher, Ooh. keep that Lothab for a while. If he's aiming to attack his Acolyte, he can also force an overdraw, which is pretty cute. If you get to burn one, anything can happen, that might decide the game. Yeah, and we won't see the burn card until the beginning of next turn, but it could be a big deal. And, and nice sequencing there, knowing yep. Malganus is the only demon in the hand. It's an anti-kill bot, which, hmm. You know, that healing might make a difference in, in the long run, but it, it just seems like Sogi has so many resources right now. Yeah. It will probably be inconsequential. It's, you know, the, the value of the coin in this matchup actually does have relevance because you can play a quality Pyromancer and then the coin. Uh, and then, of course, that gives you a, a little bit of slight board control, especially when you see two Mortal Coils being played. However, I think Sogi at this point just wants to stay on the, the draw cards plan. Just kill this Malganus. The only thing is that Malcanus by itself is still really threatening, and yet you're using one of your two equalities. Yeah. That feels really bad. Yeah, it's a, it ends up being a pretty big deal at the moment, but mm -hmm. Sogi is going to be able to draw further in his deck. There's second equality okay. in both yeah. anything's. Uh, so right now, currently, only one Bluegill Warrior, I believe, is the only Murloc <laughs> that's been played. So we're still a while away from... Uh, seeing explosive Murloc turns. And I uh, really like this proactive Doomsayer from Sogi. Yeah, it gives him initiative onto the board, which is what uh, Ping Ping Ho doesn't want to see here. If he spends, he actually can't spend his entire turn removing it. He only can do six damage from the hand. So I suppose all he can do here is to antique heal bot. His hand is too uh, full. Yeah. And he knows his opponent has access to a lot of healing. So I, I, I presume his best option 
is to play the anti Hyobot and just pass, which feels clunky to say the least. That gives Sogi complete initiative. He can do whatever he he pleases. And uh, lay on hands going into turn eight. Now that seems like a, a very enticing opportunity for him to go for it. Would he? I think he'd be at full cards, so I think he's just going to play oh, the yeah, locks. Yeah. You're, you're right if he had the opportunity to. But at the same time, you don't mind taking board control. Mm -hmm. You're putting him at 19, which is not super threatening for the Molten Giants. And with both, anything can happen. So, you know, uh, you can start getting these Murlocs out there, even just with the three sure. Murlocs that would that you know will have been killed by the time that anything can happen is played. Right. <laughs> the, the Demon Handlock already puts themselves at pretty low amounts of health. We've seen one Blue Gill Warrior. We've seen these two Murlocs. Yeah. I don't believe we've seen anything else. Nope, that's it. Okay, so that would mean that it's just a 10 damage burst for oh. the first one. But, wait, what are you groaning for, TJ? <laughs> 10 damage. It's yeah. so good. 10 damage for 10 mana. It's like yeah. Pyroblast. Yeah. What's wrong with that, TJ? It's completely it's balanced. Minions. That's what I'm saying. Oh, okay. But the second wave, TJ. Second wave, TJ could do upwards to 20, 20. Oh, sorry. No, because the second Warlock War, War Leader. I think it was like about 28 damage, which is insane. Yeah, it'd be 12 plus, uh, yeah, something like that. <laughs> 12 plus, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> I was going to say 14, uh, just because each each of the were. Uh, no, yeah, you're right. TJ, if there's anything that I've learned in my time of casting Hearthstone is don't don't try to do math. On don't, tr especially anything can happen math, because I've been in yeah. some really rough situations with anything can happen math, for sure. Uh, well, the fact that he has humility can also answer this giant, or so he thinks, because there is an ability to put additional pressure on. Yeah. I do like this attack, by the way. You want your Murlocs to die, and you can get that attack in before you can silence it. I wonder how good that Emperor Thorson is, by the way. It, I mean, it's just reducing, you know, creatures. And how, how much do you want to extend? What, what it's going to do is allow him to make a bigger turn with Lothab. Like, put more yeah. stuff on the board and sort of protect it with Lothab. But now that it's getting towards turn 10, it really doesn't protect it because he can still play Wild Pyromancer um, and uh, Equality. So it it allows him to do that. But other than that, it, it doesn't, it's not that effective. Yeah, it's, it's a good point because Wild Pyromancer Equality is nine mana. So how do you actually block it? You, unless you have Bran Bronzebeard mm -hmm. and Lothab, which isn't very common deck like this. Dr. Boom is not bad. Uh, it's it's still minion pressure, and maybe you can even force out your opponent to react to this. I really like this from Ping Ping Ho. You know, when you ignore the Murloc, yeah. he can't kill itself. Yeah. And old Murkai only wants to die right now. He does. Very solid play from Ping Ping Ho. Now, Spacing on his threats, too. Yeah, no, exactly. And, you know, the fact that he f he's understanding the situation... Only one, Mur only two Murlocs have died. Mm. Uh, old Murkai itself can't really uh, trade into it right now, and he says, "I can tap. I can get away with it." That's that's super bold to tap in this situation when you're recognizing, like, well, uh, you know, am I just gonna die? Mm -hmm. But the Paladin deck still doesn't have legitimate burst yet. Yeah, Pimpinga wants to see that second equality. That's what he's looking Let for in here. Because that's gonna give him sort of that, you know, window to just completely flood the board with as much stuff as he possibly can. And we'll see if Sogi can can navigate this turn in a way where he doesn't have to use it. Must move quickly. He still has the outdoor peacekeeper, so he can sort of nullify the Dr. Boom, and I think that's what he's going to go with. He's going to play it patiently, and I really like this. That second equality has so much value, especially in this matchup. Yeah. So, many, so many neutered threats with, with one attack. And of course, that old Merc guy just wants to end it. <laughs> Uh, of course, I apologize, by the way. Um, I believe I forgot the second Murkai would come back, which adds another 14 damage. So it's basically like about 40 damage or so. Roughly. That would come in. Assuming that you're playing the back-to-back -back anything can happen. Yeah. Um, and of course, that can amplify even more if you draw one single more uh, Murloc here to add to that. Yeah. Uh, so Ping Ping Ho here, he has some legitimate bursts from the hand, Doomguard and Dark Bombs. But how does he piece it together here? Does he play Lothab to shut things off right now? I mean, it is one thing that's interesting too is Lothab does end up creating a board where like the Paladin is also giving up a lot too. Yeah, that's very true. Um, but you know, it, it, you have to sort of realize that the Paladin doesn't really 
care about giving a lot of things up. And sometimes they're happy about giving things up because it, it, it opens up a, a lot of opportunities for them to keep pushing in. Uh, once again, spacing out his threats, he realized that even if he plays low then, mm. his board can still get removed. And I wonder if this is just going to be a, a pass from this turn. Oh, he actually is going to play it. Yeah. Okay. No, the low thab here is to try to shut it off, and he's going to force Sogi to play the wild pyromancer quality if he has it, mm -hmm. which he does. And if he and if he does play it, then he can just respond right back with um, uh, an upgrade Thorson and taunt that, and then continue the wave of taunts. Yeah, I do like this, and he's also setting up a condition that if you don't happen to draw this board clear, then uh, then you lose. Yeah, he just wins. Okay, so it consumes all of his turn. Old Murkai has finally unlocked life achievement. <laughs> die one die. time. Yeah. Uh, but now he's going to have to die probably a couple more times before this game's over. Poor little fella. But yeah, now uh, Pimping Hill has complete initiation yeah. onto this board. He now knows that both equalities are gone. Both wild pyromancers mm. are gone. He knows that... If an anything can happen is played, it would only be 10 damage. Right. So he is healthy. He, he can afford to not taunt up this turn because he's been keeping track. Yeah, this is huge. Now he can set up many taunts next turn. Mm -hmm. Luka Warrior, a little bit too late to the party because that would have added, uh, let's see, the first Merlox would be 4-4. Uh, four, four. So it would be 14 damage. Mm -hmm. No, 15 damage because the, the yeah. Murkai gets an extra damage. Yeah. That would have been it. Now, so what Soki can do is play the first anything can happen, and once again, send the Murlocs to their death. Yes. Uh, which is, again, a little bit tragic to some people, but uh, it ends up being Soki's win condition. He can also just play it a little bit slower, play True Silver, play Blue Gill, and then, you know, kind of take it like piece by piece and let yet another Murloc die. Yeah. This is a very tense situation because Soki realizes that he's not playing with the most health either. Mm -hmm. It's not exactly a very comfortable feeling to be at 14 against a, a power of nine on the board. Yeah, he does have to heal bot, but uh, he knows that the second heal bot is non-existent now since it was burned earlier in the game with a heads-up play from uh, Pinping Hill. So he's going to play it and yep. get that Bluegill Warrior killed. So this is uh, you know, pretty much as expected. And he's just going to try and you know, push a little bit of damage and set up for those anything can happens. Sure. Although he already used both of the qualities, and Pimping Hill picks up a Molten Giant. That is a, that's a huge wave of or wall of taunts. There's so m he can play so much stuff too because yeah. everything was reduced from the Emperor Thor sand. So uh, he can just uh, he'll flood the board with with yeah, pretty much everything. He can uh, play oh, lots of taunts. The Sludge Belcher. He can play the Molten and taunt it up with the Vendor of Argus yeah. and call it a day. I don't know if he wants to tab but maybe he feels even more inclined to be greedy, but I don't think greed is necessary here. In fact, it is the root of all evil, uh, yeah. according to, yeah, but according it, to some teachings. Greed is is not gonna really get punished here either. You know, so how is how is that he gonna get punished for, you know, just barfing his hand onto the floor? He's not, there's no qualities. Yep, and so he paying a huge price for not having any of the qualities here, not being very uh, patient. And as, as in contrast with Ping Ping Ho, who's been excellent so far with, like you said, spacing out all of his threats. Yeah. And now Soki has to really think, um, if he plays the first anything can happen, how much removal will he have? Will he even stay alive? And the answer might be no, because if just one, even just the Molten Giant survives, Ping Ping Ho will Dark Bomb. Yeah. And uh, he, he can sort of double up on the Blue Girl Warrior. He can trade it in mm -hmm. and then play anything can happen. So yes. let's get re-summoned. That's exactly what he does. And uh, uh -oh. yeah, I want to think twice about that. Old Merc guy. Yeah, it's probably the first thing you want to attack with. He's just dead on board still. Oh, yeah. Oh no, ah, okay. So, uh, some of the trades are a little bit awkward. He's losing power on the old, old yeah. Murkai. I think Sogi's realizing the writing on the wall here. He's gonna try his best to stabilize, but he can't even stay alive against what's on board. That's gonna wrap up game number one. Wow. An excellent chess match between Ping Ping O, sending a strong message to his Korean opponent. Yeah, cold-blooded killer Ping Ping O. Ping Ping O actually played Murloc Paladin in the preliminary for Taiwan, so He's got a lot of experience with the deck. You could tell that uh, he navigated that demon uh, handlock 
extremely well in that matchup and ends up coming out with a win. I, I really enjoyed that. Whoa, Sogi looks crushed. Yeah. Dang, I, it's, 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 you know, it's one thing to kind of just be like, well, I lost, man, it feels bad, but you know, it looks like he's getting overwhelmed by emotion right now. Yeah. Yeah. And while we Either talked that about- that or he's really examining how good his shampoo was this morning. <laughs> He's trying to make it so that he doesn't look quite, quite as much uh, like Pimpingo in this yeah. matchup. But uh, we talked <laughs> earlier. We talked earlier about how uh, Sogi is really well respected among the Korean scene. But uh, let's get to know Sogi a little bit better. We had a chance to sit down and talk with him and have a few words. I'm 25 years old. I'm 한국에 있는 창원이라는 조그만 도시에서 지금 살고 있고요. 창원은 다른 데 한국에 가장 노래방이 많은 데라서 노래방 한번 가야 되지 않을까 생각합니다. 전 잘, 저는 잘안 가는데요. 저는 집에서 많이 부릅니다. 스트림할 때 많이 많이 부르거든요. 널 뜨면 전부 내 탓이지 뭐 마침 주인이 너죠. 제가 원투스리 다 참가해서 예선전에서 초기에 떨어졌거든요. 그래서 이번에 안 되면은 그냥 하스톤을 가볍게 하는 걸로 바꿀까 아니면 아예 포기할까 생각하다가 올라가서 예선전을 또그 전부터 한국에서 유명한 실시오가 있었는데 어떻게 그분 명도에서 이기고 4강 때 스틸로라는 친구를 만났을 때그 친구가 중학교 때부터 오래 알던 사이였는데 아주 가드삼이라는 접전 끝에 이겼는데 그때 가장 기분이 좋았고 사람들 평가가 좀 재미가 없을 것 같다. 실력이 상대적으로 떨어질 것 같다. 뭐 이런 평가가 있었는데 제가 이때까지 보여준 것들이 작기 때문에 제가 제일 약하다고 생각할 수도 있는데 하스톤이 랭크만으로 결정되는 게임이 아니거든요. 저는 딱히 딱 어떤 덱을 해야 된다. 나의 스타일은 이거다. 이런 게 없는 것 같거든요. 모든 덱을 어, 잘하는 수준까지 플레이할 수 있다고 생각하기 때문에 전략면에서 제가 좀더 유리하지 않나 생각합니다. 앞으로 보여드릴 모습을 생각해서 제가 제일 약한 사람은 아닐 사고 보여주면 될것 같아요. 전석입니다. 아시아 최강은 한국이라는 것을 보여드리도록 하겠습니다. 석이 is just a calculated player who just likes to figure out the meta, and he said he doesn't have his style. He just wants to play what he thinks is best. And not working out for him so far, but you know, I, I, I like that type of that type of attitude where uh, he he really just wants to find out what's best, and he doesn't really care what people think about the decks that he brings. Yeah, I think I think it's very clear. You know, the fact that he's willing to sing on stream too and just yeah. put a mouse out there. That sure. He doesn't really care what people think. Uh, and you know what? Honestly, like I said, that confidence it's uh, sorely missing from a lot of players. So yeah. props to him. Yeah, props to him. And you guys, let us get on Twitter, get on uh, social media, let us know what you think. You can tweet at Play Hearthstone <laughs> about about Sogi singing. Yeah. Let us know what you think about Pin Ping Ho's swag. Uh, get on Twitter, get on Facebook, yeah. at Play Hearthstone, Facebook.com slash Play Hearthstone. Use the hashtag HCT. Of course, as you can see, we've been featuring the tweets on stream. So uh, who do you want to win this matchup? Uh, it's it's a little bit tough. I think uh, both these guys. You know what? I, I, Korea's won a lot today, and I feel like uh, let's you be know, honest. It, Korea's won a lot forever. Yeah, it's true. Korea is is, is doing very well this tournament, and mm. rightfully so. They're definitely one of the underrated regions of uh, Hearthstone. People look at Asia. Uh, they primarily look at China, you know, because they have so many top players, uh, and their region is so huge. However, Korea is uh, has a really decent amount of players. Look at Stilo. You look at yeah. Dawn, for example, who won uh, WCA last yeah. year. Um, and even though, like, So Si Ho, like, some of these players are pretty good. Yeah. Uh, and it's about time they made a splash. However, uh, Ping Ping Ho comes in here as one of the Taiwan stalwarts. Him, Tom60229, Roger. These yep. guys have been playing for so long and always getting to the very ends of the tournament. It doesn't surprise me at all to see Ping Ping Ho doing well here. Yeah, Ping Ping Ho, though, uh, that big tournament win has eluded him. He's plays very highly at a lot of events, and he's qualified for a lot of major and premier events, including the World Championship last year. So he's definitely looking for that win, and he does not lack the confidence to do it. And we've talked about Sogi before, but after talking with, you know, Papa Smithy and Doa and, 
and some of the the Korean players they they tend to think Korea as a region suffers from a lack of creativity and they just like to play the the meta decks and Sogi just sort of exemplifies that type of play he's he's you know the Korean Hearthstone player in a nutshell okay so we have on ourselves oh, yes. a good old class in Mergulov. <laughs> the Murgulov. A Murloc Paladin versus a Murloc Paladin. Mm. Uh, the mirror... The mirror... I'm not going to lie here. The mirror is is often a pile of chaos, it's, TJ. It's uh, it's brutal to watch and to play. Uh, th think of it very similar to Freeze Mage Mirrors, yes. where a lot of the plays don't seem very intuitive. Remember, mm -hmm. cards like Murloc Warleader buff all Murlocs. Murkai has plus damage for each Murloc on the battlefield, including your opponents. So if you play Murloc Warleader, your opponent might just blue kill right into it, and you lose all board control for less mana. So you're, you out-tempoed yourself. Uh, these are these are some small nuances that at first are not very intuitive. DJ and, looks like he wants to say something. And anything can happen summons any Murloc that has died that game. Exactly. So, including your opponents. So, so some people have trouble keeping track of their own Murlocs. <laughs> now they have to keep track of their own plus their opponents. Yeah. It's impossible. Uh, it's not impossible. Uh, For there me, are, it's impossible, Dan. There are a couple of rules with some corollaries. Uh, the first is that you don't want to be the person to play the first anything can happen. Because if, yeah. if the person clears it uh, and they play a second anything can happen, you're in trouble. <laughs> now, there's the caveat to that is if you can play anything can happen, and then you have a Korean list that happens to play, um, you know, Lothab, for example, then that does actually give you a chance to strike back. Sometimes you can play anything can happen twice in a row against your opponent, and he can't respond. He has to just keep clearing, and then you win. So it, the matchup has, is, is a very tight one. It's, it's a, there's a lot of, like, tension going back and forth. And, of, of course, we're starting to see some separation, too. Peeping Ho plays a muster for battle version, which gives him... Uh, some interesting dynamics with cards like Sol Solemn Vigil because he might be able to trade a little bit more effectively on his turn mm -hmm. and thus be able to draw more. Yeah. So we're definitely going to see the, the two styles that Murloc Paladin clash in. Uh, this matchup can... Uh, you talked a little bit about it, but there's two different like ways that this matchup usually plays out. And one is that super long game that we talked about where some of the plays tend to get uh, pretty unintuitive and you're afraid to play anything can happen because you have to do the exact math if you want to win. But then there's some times right. where, you know, there's so many Murlocs drawn and played in the early game that the first person that plays anything can happen just wins. Uh, sort of similar to Freeze Mage, where a lot of times it comes down to uh, the first person that gets that Alex draws off, the first person that can pop that first block wins. So uh, there are a couple different ways, but mm -hmm. it, it it gets a little dicey sometimes. Well, this is already interesting to me because Ping Ping Ho has commanding board position for now. Uh, so he's going to be forced to consecrate this, I believe. Unless he feels safe enough to just develop True Silver Champion, but uh, you, you, you want to control the state of the board. Although, actually, he doesn't have to because he has Pyromancer as well. This is interesting. He's got a multiple, uh, a few different options now that I really analyze it. The thing about Consecration, too, is that it is a really good access to board clear. Yeah. So I think he doesn't feel that under that much pressure. Yeah. Yeah. Now, uh, over on Ping Ping Ho's side, he doesn't actually have much card draw outside of the Solemn Vigil. He did pick up Lay on Hands, which is pretty good. Uh, don't be surprised to see him just, like, take it a little bit slower. Yeah, uh, just keep hero power and keep, keep putting on pressure. And, uh, sometimes his chip damage can matter later in the game, so, you know, especially yeah. if a lot of Murlocs aren't played. And uh, again, that's where you have to sort of do that math. You, you, you don't really want to play Murlocs later in the game if if you know that your opponent has the initiative on the anything can happen and, and you're low enough to where if you play another Murloc and it dies, you'll give your opponent lethal mm. on the following turn. Would you uh, would you just trade the coin in to get a draw off your acolyte? <clears throat> Play pyromancer coin or with the acolyte and coin it. Yeah, and it's also a a, a clean board clear. Uh, you know that you'll have an activator later in the game. You know if things get sticky and if you need to use uh, if you pick up that equality. So uh, I definitely like that. It also allows you to not that you would use a true silver champion anyway, but you get a good board state. You have a true silver champion. You have the board so. Seems pretty good. Yeah, board aggression is not exactly uh, ideal sometimes. I again, it's 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 very situational based. Um, sometimes your hand just says you have a lot of Murlocs and you play it, but both of these guys have relatively 
passive hands. Um, we have the first anything can happen, but like we said, first anything doesn't guarantee victory at all. Yeah. There are a couple of uh, important damage thresholds as well. When you've played all five Murlocs, assuming those are the fives that you did, the normal ones, two blue gills, two war leaders, and a Murkai, it is 22 damage, um, which just... But like you said, if you just get one single Murloc in, in addition to that, it's pushing 29 plus. Yeah. Which um, can be just game ending. Usually game ending. Usually so. game ending. But the players will be wise to avoid that. Yeah. And I, I imagine playing this deck, you get a good oh. sense of what your opponent's supposed to be doing. The first Murloc has appeared. Uh oh. It is old Murkai. And so it begins. Well, uh, Piping Ho has an answer to it with the True Silver Champion. He also, uh, let's see, what else can he develop behind it? I was thinking about playing just a hero power, but he also has the ability to develop other stuff too. The question is, how does he want to set up his Lay on Hands turn too? He's definitely going to be playing card what draw when he can. Think. Yeah. If he wants to, he can sacrifice in uh, Blue Gear Warrior to take out the 1-1. One, one. It but feels like you don't want to do that because yeah. Blue Gate Warrior also can act as removal. Not to mention you strengthen the case of yeah. your opponent playing anything. One thing that is important to note is if Ping Ping Ho hits turn 10, and let's say in the hypothetical situation where enough Murlocs die, then he might be able to pressure before his opponent because he'll hit turn 10 before, his, before Sogi does. Yeah, and he knows that Sogi has thrown away the coin, so... Uh, I don't know if it's going to get to that point because it doesn't feel like enough Murlocs will have been played by the time we get to that point. But uh, again, even just playing a anything can happen with just a few Murlocs, you know, just two or three or four can be enough because your opponent has to remove those, you know, to not succumb to the pressure. And they also have to worry about, well, if I remove it, I'm just going to give him lethal. So uh, it becomes a, a, a tough situation. And... I have a feeling I'm going to need a pen, TJ, to keep track of everything. I got you covered, Dan. Do you have a pen? I do. Oh, he does. Ah, you got a pen. So, because the thing is, keeping track of the Murlocs will be really important because it feels like Sogi has to be aggressive here. Um, if your opponent gives you the board to be slightly pre to be pressuring slightly with it, anything can happen. I don't think I mind this because I think if you pass and your opponent gets a free lay on hands, you essentially just gave up a lot of tempo to your opponent. Yeah, so it's just one Murkai that's died. And, uh, well, Bluegill's now here. Uh, and a Bluegill. Well. So right now, uh, let me count. Uh, two damage. Mm. Well, uh, five, actually, if both if it dies and he gets revived. But I get what you're saying. Ah! <clears throat> Can never get it right. Math is hard. Math is hard. Not for these guys, though. Piping Ho, he's got the ability to just lay on hands. I think he's debating if he wants to swing with the weapon, and if so, at what. The, the, the common what thing would be to swing at the Alder Peacekeeper. You not only avoid killing the Murloc, but it's better stats. Yeah. He's opting instead. Looks like he wants to play Wild Pyromancer and draw cards. So he addresses the board. This is pretty cute play as well. <laughs> he's only drawing two. But, you know, the anything can happen is still a pretty good card to draw. Yeah. And that's one way that you can get blown out of the game if you just never draw your anythings. Okay. Because then you can never put on the pressure. Now, a lay on hands for Sogi, so he's going to draw as well. Another blue gill warrior. So, at this point, Sogi has to choose if he wants to swing with his weapon, but I don't think he feels incredibly threatened. So he does end up passing. And that gives Ping Ping Ho initiative to finally play his lay on hands, but the problem is he has a Bile Pyromancer on board. So he, he actually cornered himself in a little bit. Yeah. I don't think he, it really matters at this point uh, with those two creatures. Um, especially since, uh, I mean, I guess applying the pressure is always good, but he, wow. So he's actually going to wait another turn. I think he might consider playing the Murlocs. If he plays the Murlocs, he attacks for four to the face. Then, no, you only have one War Leader out. Yes. If your opponent clears the board. So at that point, if he had played that, if your opponent clears, you have two blue blue gills, one Murkai, and one war leader played total. All right, that's Let 15 damage. Think. Yes. And if you you can put him down to 22 right now. So you'd be seven short. Yeah. 
Uh, also, the Truce of a Champion heals, too. Yeah. Uh, it just doesn't seem like it's worth it. Yeah, you know, PP Hill might even just play the heal bot then, if he doesn't feel like doing it. Okay, so he's just saying, this is the board, deal with it. And I think PP Ho is really regretting the choice of playing the Power Mancer, considering that they lay on hands. Yeah, it, it seemed like a cute play at the time, but he could have played the Solid Vigil um, without the Power Mancer, or, you know, he could have just held on to it to, to try and use it as a, as a board removal. He could have even just given up the Pyromancer and gone for a lay on hands last turn. Because now it's going to yep. be tough for him to find a turn to do that. Uh, especially since Toki's just drawn so much over the past couple turns that he, he's bound to have enough stuff to start pressuring. Does Sogi play this Blue Gear Warrior? He has a many thing can happen. This would be the second Blue Gear Warrior. And now Ping Ping Ho realizes, well, how do I deal with this? Oh, interesting. He has Doomsayer. That's that might encourage him to lay on hands of Doomsayer. Does he have enough cards to get away with that? He has eight cards. He'd be dumping two, so that is reasonable play. He can lay on hands first, evaluate, and then play the Doomsayer. Yeah. And then the Doomsayer activates on his turn, so it's like he gets the initiative of playing what anything can happen. Yep. Off of it. However, I think Ping Ping Ho also has to keep in mind that Sogi gets pro, uh, like, if he can answer this, say he plays Keeper of Oldemon or some other card to easily kill it, then uh, he's giving Sogi more proactive yeah, or even measures just, uh, to develop. Like he has a Consecrate, too, so he, he does have a way to deal with the Doomsayer if he wants to. Yeah, to there's many ways to deal with yeah. it. You can, um, you can actually kill off your own Murloc, too, by playing a Pyromancer and a Humility, for example. Um, and then using like the humility as like AOE to, to yeah. kill it off. Yeah. Uh, very cute stuff overall. Mm. It, it really depends on how Sogi wants to distribute his cards. <laughs> I think um, if he does, he can also draw with the Solemn Vigil, but that also kills off the Pyromancer. So awkward. Is he gonna use a quality here? He feels like he can't get better use out of it immediately. <laughs> That's going to allow him to play the Solemn Vigil for four. Yeah. I don't know. It's a pretty expensive Solemn Vigil still. And he's not exactly free to play any other card after it. Well, he still has a couple oh, cards to play, uh, like Wild Pyromancer. He, mm. he can even just play the Outdoor Peacekeeper on the board as a 3-3. Three, three. Yeah. Because there aren't, aren't too many targets in this deck. It's true. Uh, where, you know, you get, you're going to want an Outdoor. It's a good point. Ping Ping Ho. I mean, he's like, this is... Reasonable amount of pressure, oh, but again, man. you're not going to want to play Murlocs into this at all. I wonder if he plays Dr. Boom, because the thing about uh, the muster for battle list is that it plays a lot more minions yeah. on curve, like you said, so you can stabilize the board and then leverage those minions and mm. that did damage with Dr. Boom to maybe curve out into a stronger anything can happen. Yeah. This was a list that was popularized by Kalento mm -hmm. because he felt like the original list played by guys like Neville's was too combo oriented or dog. Yeah and not like enough sturdiness. He, That's why he even plays Zombie Chow, which is counterintuitive to a combo deck. Yeah, even uh, like Strife Crow played the, the slower that. version, uh, the, like the, bo the version that Sogi's running. So it's kind of funny that both of those guys, you know, teammates with such polarizing uh, styles of the same deck. Sure. Again, very meticulous to avoid playing the Murlocs. Right now, again, by our count, anything can happen should spawn uh, Eight damage. Eight damage. <laughs> A whole whopping ten mana eight damage. So how, how do you become the first player that plays the anything can happen? Oh, so one of the things that you actually can do is chain your threats. So that way he has to answer it. Um, so you have, a, like, th think of it similar to... If you can leverage your board at, in the Freeze Mage Mirrors to put on a little bit of pressure to force yeah. action and get advantage that way, there is a chance that the matchup just goes to Fatigue and then you wait to Fatigue and you just go for the burst damage that way too. Yeah. Because um, remember, they're drawing through their decks pretty considerable amount as well. Yeah. So uh, right now, Paping Ho's biggest concern is how to get past cards like a Sludge Belcher and he can just use an Equality, for example, because he has two of them. Yeah, it does it's have it's the, more than reasonable. Does have the Solemn Vigil as well. It looks like right. actually Sogi is running out of cards. He has mm. six cards remaining. So again, right. 10. Another thing to consider, too, is that if you have two anythings can happens, which neither of them do, you can put pressure on the board first, know that they can't kill you. If you can set up a situation where you anything can happen and they can't use it right back at you to kill you, then you can use a second one. So right now, I think in 
Soki's, no sorry, in Ping Ping Ho's mind, he wants to make sure that he can chain and anything can happen twice to make yeah. sure to guarantee to do above 30 damage. Yeah. Because if you have six minions of Murlocs, almost any combination will guarantee a one turn kill as long as there's no taunts on the board. Yeah. But we, we're still only halfway there. We have three minions and you need Murloc, War Leaders, and another Murkai. Well, they're sitting and waiting in the hand, just waiting to be played. But okay. it's super risky to just throw them out there. So if you play Murloc War Leader and push for... Okay, well, I guess not that much. Yeah. <laughs> push for one. Well, I mean, the re the reality is, if he plays for Murloc War Leader and forces the opponent to address it, he still has a true silver champion as well. Let's move quickly. That means it is upwards to 20 damage, if assuming he can hit with uh, like a token as well. Yeah. It's not... It's not... Uh, it's not like a danger zone for either player. You can see they're in the 20s. Yeah. And this is the second anything can happen from Ping Ping Ho. So uh, how does he choose to play this? If he plays... His Murlocs will get buffed by Sogi's War Leader. Right. But also... Oh, no, that was the only War Leader that was played. So mm -hmm. uh, Ping Ping Ho won't have a War Leader. So he doesn't have to worry about Sogi's War Leader getting buffed right. from his War Leader. But the problem is Sogi has a preemptive board. So he if he plays anything can happen, and say he trades into it, so he just plays his anything can happen and, and destroy Ping Ping Ho. Yeah. Uh, so now Ping Ping Ho probably will consider clearing the board oh, first wow. somehow, except he doesn't have Consecration or Pyromancer. He's got this really annoying slime <laughs> in the way that he might have to use his own uh, Murloc to clear and then choose over champion. And if he plays Blue Gill Warrior and kills off the Murloc War Leader, that would have been three Blue Gills, a Murk Guy, and a War Leader played. Is that enough to kill him? Oh, he just draws Dr. Boom a little bit too late. So yeah. he's, he's playing it even slower right now, and I can completely respect this because he knows, he knows if he plays the Murlocs with his opponent having the board, he's in trouble. So he has eight damage uh, showing on board plus. If he plays, anything can happen here. That's uh, 15 damage. Yeah. So 23 yeah. damage. He has max. 23. It's not. It's not enough. So I guess you can still just play Sludge Belger. Your opponent clearly showed difficulty of doing something last turn. So yeah. I don't mind playing the stage Sludge Belger in the heal bot here. And that damage adds up, and he, he's getting in the damage from these creatures this turn as well. So. It's starting to look pretty good for him. Just having that initi uh, initiative on the board it ends up being huge in this matchup, it seems. Mm -hmm. And if my calculations are correct... Oh, he's choosing the pass. Okay, so he chose the pass, meaning that he's afraid of overextending onto the board. And Ping Ping Ho is going to kill this Murloc War Leader, which means he has 15 damage right back that anything can happen. So the Dr. Boom is his best chance to develop. Yeah. I think he might even consider... No, he can't play another Murloc. Yeah, if he, he plays another Murloc, he dies. He's dead, he's dead yeah. So right now, Sogi has... will have 23 damage once again. Uh, since he has the 8 damage represented on board. Plus, it'll be the same damage because the War Leader will be resummoned, mm -hmm. which would be 15 from the end if it can happen. Thing. Right. So he can't play another Murloc because... Uh, he could just, just trade in um, and die, and it would oh. be enough damage. But he's got the second anything can happen. Now, does that change anything here? If he plays the first one, then his opponent will trade into the board too. This is, again, the problem that if the opponent has any board. <laughs> the only scenario you can chain anything can happen is your opponent has to address it right back. Yeah. Hmm. Um, so, <laughs> we're <laughs> caught in the exact same situation, because he can't kill his opponent. One damage. You see, but I, I don't think he really has to be worried about dying, you know? Because um, uh, he, he knows that anything can happen at this stage in the game hmm. is just 15 damage. So even if you count the 15 plus all of the damage on the board, that's well, still only 25 damage. What's really scary, though, is that Ping Ping Ho controls the board pretty commandingly. Um, so he's going to have to play Sludge Belcher here, I think. The nice thing is, like you said, because humility, he doesn't actually have to worry about Dr. Boom pushing seven damage to face every single turn. Otherwise, he'd really be in trouble. Yeah, now Sogi just once again puts himself in a spot where he's got that board. Okay. And so, <laughs> oh. 
I wonder if Pimping Ho feels comfortable of playing. No, I can't. I can't do that. I was thinking because if you know that you're at 24, you can play into the first anything can happen, but you don't play into the second one. If you catch my drift, TJ. Yeah. This matchup is incredibly difficult from both sides. I and you can't even imagine the stress being as a player right now. Mm. Yeah. Not even just a matchup, just like being up on that stage and knowing that so many people are watching you play Murloc Paladin versus Murloc Paladin. I think PBHO might be tempted to use a quality number two here. Yeah. Although, realistically, right. passing also isn't the worst option in the world because you know your opponent's limited on damage and your, it, the onus is on your opponent to develop. So I wouldn't be mad at this equality, but I can totally understand why you might feel otherwise. You know, another option is to play equality and then develop a single Murloc that isn't dead. Okay, so he plays equality, so that way he can guarantee it. All right, so this second blue kill means that four, 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 twelve plus. F uh, or is nine so well nine twenty one? Twenty one damage? Yeah, twelve plus nine. Cause three blue gills, one merc guy, one war leader. The merc guy is at a with the war leader, a uh, base five mm. plus the three from the blue gills. So that'd be No plus the four because war leader's a merc guy as well. Okay, yep. Oh no no, you're right, so it's twenty damage. Yeah, twenty damage. Okay. I apologize. Because the merc guy does not count itself. That's right. <laughs> He's doing the same thing we are, except we have two minds yeah. that are failing at this, and he has one person trapped in the chasm of his own mind. Yeah. Dan and it. I are sitting here. Isn't it paper? He has to use his fingers. Yeah, they, someone yeah. Get, someone exactly. get this man an abacus. <laughs> they said pen and paper were banned, <laughs> but what about alternative means of counting? Who says Hearthstone doesn't take skill? Yeah. Look at this, man. He's like, well, I ran out of fingers, and I can't count that high. <laughs> you see him take off his shoe and start like, hey, counting on hey. his toes. <laughs> hey, Dahuni, come over here and you need to borrow your fingers. <laughs> well, you know, Ping Ping Ho, right back, has actually minions to play. Any minion that you pick up that's not a Murloc is actually pretty good. And you know what? We're getting to the stages where fatigue damage might be relevant as well. Yeah. I'm almost out of and now he doesn't have... Theoretically, he, has, he would have enough damage if he uh -huh. could summon all of his Murlocs. Well, but he, he doesn't have room on the board. This was actually... Oh, wait, that equality. Okay, so he's going to play anything can happen here. And that's really good. So Soki realizes that this is the moment where his opponent has to respond to Look, this. Look at Pippico's face. He's like, what? And um, that that's just... It because his yeah. Merc guy's gonna be huge. He's getting two <laughs> war leaders. He's like, Pimico is like, what the heck's going on? What After all happened? of that, we just went through 30 minutes of Murloc Paladin versus Murloc No, no, Paladin. no. He, I think Ping Ping Ho's. Does he? That, that's enough damage. Yeah. Yeah, I, I think he just was caught off guard because he's like, why did you just do that? Yeah. And so he is crushed. Yeah. Because this is supposed to be his match. Yeah. He said, I don't think your experience helps you at all. You know, Pimping Ho was so floored by what just happened. I, he, he looked offended. I mean, we said it. The first person who plays into it, anything can happen might just lose. Yeah. So in this case, Soki cracked under the pressure straight up. He's think, You know what he's thinking? He's thinking about the rule early in the game. There is a rule to this matchup. In the very be beginning, if the board is clear, you can chain two anythings can happen and actually win at that point because you're the first and second player to play anything yeah. can happen. But we're so late into the game that enough Murlocs have died for it to be just a, a 33 damage swing right back because he got buffed by the, more, uh, the war leader, which counted as a six minion on his side. So uh, a very anticlimactic but equally hilarious game. For, yeah. To wrap up number two. Definitely. Uh, that was definitely an exciting one. And I, I, I wonder what was going through uh, Sogi's mind there. You could see a lot of people uh, going for going for Pimpingo there. But uh, what a crazy match. And you could tell Pimpingo there at the very end was, was quite animated. And uh, we, we sat down with Pimpingo earlier in the week. So let's get to know a little bit more about the notorious PING.
I'm Kuo Ping Ho. I'm 28. I'm from Taiwan. For Taiwan's Hearthstone scene, right now we have like several top level players in Taiwan, but there are many of them because most of people couldn't make a living out of it. Uh, many people think that I'm special for playing shaman, but I don't think that's an important part of me. The reason why I play shaman is because I want to have my personal style, but it doesn't have to be shaman. I usually show my style through some kind of special like deck buildings, and it will make people think, "Wow, this is Pinking Ho." Some people play shaman in the Europe and America Championship, but they suck. They are not Pinking Ho style. Because there's no imagination, they are not creative. At 2014, people thought I was the best Hearthstone player in Taiwan. Right now, I think it is Tom 60229. But who cares if I'm the best? I'm still going to win the Winter Championship and win BlizzCon. Since BlizzCon, I've been doing nothing other than preparing for this Winter Championship. For every day for me, it's usually like waking up 2 p.m. in the afternoon and maybe eat some breakfast and then play some Hearthstone. Go to eat dinners and I'll go back to playing Hearthstone. And I'll play Hearthstone until I go to bed. I usually take a lot of effort into relaxing before tournaments. I usually practice a lot less. I will make sure that I am in my best state when I play the tournament. My number one supporter in this world is me. Winning this tournament will mean a lot to me because I have never really won a major tournament and it has always been my dream to be a world champion. For people who don't believe that I will win, who cares about them? I'm still going to win. This weekend, when I'm playing my match, please spam Guoping Guoping 30 to show your support. To all my opponents this weekend, I have to say sorry because they might have to try again. My name is Ping Ping Ho and I am here on my road to BlizzCon 2016. Well, you know what they always <laughs> say, Dan, Pin Ping ain't easy. Oh my god. <laughs> Hearthstone all day, Hearthstone all night. The life we're of a... We're pimping all over the world. <laughs> <laughs> oh, Indeed. Uh, it's just too close to the actual word, TJ. That's why it's funny. Puns are hilarious. 2-0 is the lead for Pimping Ho here, as he is uh, quite possibly just going to sweep Sogi with his warrior as his last remaining deck. Mm -hmm. uh, taking a look at how his style is, he plays a control style, so it wouldn't surprise me to see him play Control Warrior, which would be another attempt at Murloc Paladin if you do read that as Control Warrior, because Murloc Paladin is insanely good against uh, Control Warrior because you can just nonstop put pressure onto the board with Murlocs and they have to kill it, and yeah. then you just do the uneven waves. Yep. Indeed. Yeah, Pimping Ho, a lot of players don't really know him to be too much of a control player just because they focus so much on Shaman. And yep. uh, he said in his interviews that he sort of wants to make his decks his style. And I asked him a little bit deeper, like, no, really, though, like, why aren't you bringing Shaman? It actually is okay. And he said, Agro Shaman is not real Shaman. He said in Taiwan, they call Agro Shaman Rexar because, you know, oh. like similarities of face hunter. So he said, they do. Yeah, he said, that's not real Shaman. Feels bad, you know, the fact that you even managed to make Shaman uh, a viable deck, and then all of a sudden, no one even calls you Shaman, they just call <laughs> you Rexar. Yeah. Well, there you go. 2 0 is the lead. Peeping Ho, one game away from, well, so just, I mean, Sogi looks really defeated right now, so mm. just put him out of his misery, I say. Yeah, I uh, see. He just looks super stressed, and you can tell last game, I'm not sure what was going through his head when he played that, but you can tell yeah. instantly, as soon as he saw the Murlocs come onto the field, he he just, you know, put his his hand, his face in his hands and mm -hmm. um, just looked devastated. So, but let's move on to this next match. It is going to be Pin Ping Ho with what looks to be a control warrior, pretty much to be yep. expected, and Sogi with a Reno Warlock, if I had to say so. The, re the reality is, playing perfectly with a Murloc Paladin is extremely difficult, oh, especially yeah. in the mirror. Uh, so it could be that Sogi just needs a break. 
to, yeah. to set, reset from the stress. Yeah. He's also saying if this happens to be a patient warrior, this deck would be really effective against it. Yeah, and since they don't have the, you know, they, they, they can't write on these like we did on a piece of paper and count, you know, yeah, we, uh, meticulously count the damage. We did it, man. We, we, we got pens. The PAs were trying to help us. Doa was doing sign language. <laughs> yeah. Kibler was probably tweeting something related to the actual answer, and I was peeking at it. It was yeah. we, had, we had a group effort, and we still had trouble figuring it out. These guys are under a lot of stress. Uh, but I'm enjoying every second of the ride here. Peeping Ho is going to be playing Control Warrior, and we've seen this matchup a lot, TJ, uh, from, from both sides here. But... I defer to you as the person who is the control warrior expert. Warrior is your favorite class. Yes, it is, so Dan. Let's break down this matchup. Uh, can you tell me who you're leaning towards these days um, in, in terms of the, the warrior camp or the warlock camp? Well, it, it depends on a few things. And one of the things that it depends on, we can actually see in Sogi's hand right now, and that's the Lord Jaraxxus. Lord Jaraxxus is a card that not all Reno Warlocks put in, but it's so crucial in the control matchups just because of the infinite waves of uh, infernals that you can you can spawn with with your axis and just the the consistent damage of the hero power as well so uh, that's a key card another key card that's sort of the counterpart to that is the harrison jones but you, you you sort of find yourself in a situation a lot of times where you can't use harrison jones because you'll fatigue out of the matchup uh so um i it, it's really close at this point now that we see what type of arena warlock it is but I still always lean towards the control warrior, Dan. Elise can do some crazy things in long matches. Yeah, that's assuming Ping Ping Ho does play Elise, which I anticipate yeah, it, it actually happening. It also depends on what type of uh, the rest of Sogi's Reno Warlock deck, uh, what type of win condition he actually runs. Uh, because there's Fugin and Stalag, which is a which used to be sort of the more common version. And more recently, the uh, combo type style, where you run you know Emperor Thorsen with either Leroy Jenkins and Arcane Golem, and Face Manipulator with Power Overwhelming, which can lead you to be able to do a lot of burst in a single turn. Um, sure. It, it it tends to uh, struggle to find that type of win condition, but if you can get your axes down early, start getting Infernals, force a lot of removal out, chip away at the armor. Uh, eventually, you can win this matchup, but it is close. Yep, it's a really good point. Um, that it, it really does depend on how you're able to line up your threats yeah. as uh, the Warlock player. You're the one putting the onus uh, on the Warrior to respond to it. And Pei Ping Ho doesn't happen to have the ideal removal. So, for example, it doesn't have Shield Slam for this uh, Twilight Drake, and it's just going to be able to whack away, which is exactly what Soki wanted. Yep. Because his turn four was pretty weak. You don't want to play Defender of Argus onto a board like that. You want to get higher value. All right, so uh, double revenge in Gorhal. If we think back a few weeks ago to the America's Championship, this looks very similar to the style of deck that a few of those players were, were running, including Amnesiac, who ended up winning the America's Championship. This deck looks almost identical to it uh, sure. so far. Right, it is a callback to a deck that I believe Eversiction has used a lot. Uh, he is a player that's uh, decently known amongst yep. the other players in North America. He beats me in open tournaments way too often, Dan. And uh, his, his original version actually ran zero threats, uh, topped out at just a card true heart. And uh, basically, he just he ran so much removal and would fatigue every matchup, including against decks like Zoo Warlock, because you know eventually your opponent's going to run out of threats too, and you're just going to have much more health than they do. Yep, makes a lot of sense. Um, you're, you're basically playing a fatigue style. It doesn't usually go to killing your opponent through fatigue. Yeah. You do have a win condition, Gromash, for example, being it. But you're super defensive. So the better way to, to summarize this deck or archetype is um, Removal Warrior, where mm -hmm. you're just constantly playing super amounts of control until you're able to run your opponent out of threats and then use your own. So Pingpingho has Gorehal, which he inevitably wants to play the following turn. Now his, his question is, do, is it worth spending cards like Shield Maiden and Sludge Belcher, which inevitably get removed anyways, and then Gorehal has less value? Yeah. These uh, are hard questions to answer, because Pingpingho um, doesn't want to just lose things for free, but at the same time doesn't want to just pass either. Especially against Arena. The in uh, this, this goes back a little bit, but uh, just in, in terms of the tournament meta and the beginning of the match when you're deciding, you'll see a lot of players on the first day when they don't know their opponent's decks uh, sometimes will lean towards banning Warlock because um, having uh, playing against a Warlock that you don't know what it is, or even just playing against Arena Warlock that you don't know what their tech choices are, what type of Arena Warlock it is, 
can be really daunting because you don't know what you're saving your removal for. Yeah. You have all this removal in your hands, but you don't know what it's going to be used on, and you can't plan ahead as well as you would be able to. So uh, it, it can be pretty scary. And right now, Pimping Ho, he, he just doesn't know, you know where that Gore Howl is going to go. He doesn't know if there's going to be even any more targets for it. So it can be pretty tough and a pretty daunting task to go up against a Warlock deck that you really have no idea what it is. Well, I, I do like the, the Gore Howl now. You have two shield mains to bounce back, even though you're looking at a uh, reasonable amount of power on board. And there's also Zombie Chow, so it feels like you have a lot of health to play with. And if you don't take the time to develop Gore Howl now, you will have an awkward time from this point on, so I like it. Now, of course, Soki would love to draw weapon removal, but he doesn't have that ability. However, he has a really good alternative on turn seven to play a Dr. Boom. However, if you see Gore Howl and you see two Revengers, I think Sogi realizes what kind of list this is. So he might be questioning if he's playing too deep into Brawl already. Um, there are some pretty bad alternatives if a Boombot survives or if a Zombie Chow survives, to which he doesn't get value off Dr. Boom. And so I like this play. He's, he's trying to say, you know what? I don't want to extend too far into yeah. a potential Brawl because that deck usually runs two. Yeah, definitely. Uh, probably 90 plus percent of the time runs two. And I really have to play too, you know, healing up that Twilight Drake to put it right out of range of that now six damage Gore Howl instead of healing his face because really the, the face damage doesn't matter much at all in this matchup. You know, the only type of burst that the control warrior is going to have is, is the Grom Hellscream. And you know, you're going to end up playing Draxes at some point in the game anyway. Yep. So you're going to go down to 15. Uh, yeah, the, the, the damage isn't irrelevant either. If you look at Ping Ping Ho, like, getting the armor might give him some time to outlast the fatigue stages of the game. Yeah. This could realistically go for uh, another 20 minutes. Like, we could just be getting started, TJ. Ah, yes. Especially if it's a reverse sweep, because this series has already gone on as long as all the other series of the day. And it's 2-0. So I was thinking about uh, using Bash and Sludge Belcher, but I wasn't sure if he was going to attack. And I guess his logic is he doesn't want he wants the Sludge Belcher to be protected as best as possible. Yeah. Um, so that way the Gore Howl can get value. And I think Sogi is just going to play Boom here because now the board is nowhere near as bad as it was before. Yeah. His opponent has to give up something as well. And so far we're not seeing any pieces of of either of the win conditions that I talked about before, the Fugan or Slag or uh, the Burst combination with the uh, Arcane Golem, Power Woman, Baseless Manipulator combination. So this seems like more like the value Reno. Sure. Uh, where you run more overall strong minions, but not a singular win condition. Yeah, you just have a lot of board presence over yeah. and over and over. Um, Fugan and Stalag, I be, wouldn't be surprised to see him not be playing that. He could be playing Demons straight up. Um, Malgana's Voidcaller, Doomguard, for example, as mm -hmm. like a trio package. We've seen them be included. We've even seen like Mountain Giant Reno and just play like just really dominant threats. And if you don't answer this, I'm just going to do eight damage per turn. Yeah. The variation is quite staggering to the point where it's almost impossible just to predict. Yeah. It definitely is. And there's not really any cards that indicate to you which type it is until you see uh, the one that tells you. And there's Reno Jackson. No cast, you're fired. <laughs> Yeah, it, he, he is a producer working the backstage, even getting in on the Ping Ping Ho jokes. Uh, Soki, he, he also does have too many cards, so he can't even like life tap as liberally as he'd like to. This is something that Reno players often struggle with because they're not sure what's the delicate balance of how much they can tap. So, you know, you might see Soki play a little bit even more aggressive on board just because he has too many cards. Mm. Does he like part ways with Demon Wrath, for example, just because he needs to tap? Like, he can Demon Wrath, Dark Bomb. Okay, well, now Demon Wrath got much worse. <laughs> just, he just gave that up. Right. I mean, I think his thinking was he had only upside to attack into it. Yeah, well, I, the, the Boom Bot would have died anyway. Right. So he right. was thinking that, hey, if it hits a Lease for two damage, I can still Demon Wrath, so. He could have hit phase and then demon round. He could, yeah, yeah, that's true. It would have increased the odds. The stress, he needs to play something, and I don't think uh, Reno Jackson is it. I would also think he's considering playing Jaraxxus. One of the things that you can also consider is that if you just play Jaraxxus, can you uh, get away with it? We've seen players try it. In fact, the preliminaries, 
we saw an exact player get away with it and win. I believe it was Sky High yeah. that was able to pull it off. Just slammed it. Right, against yeah. the, the Warlock, which plays really yeah. slow. But then we also saw in the Grand Finals, Nostum tried the exact same thing, where he just slammed Drax and he lost. Yep. So it's a... Uh, it's a gamble, of course. It is. It's, 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 it's a risk. And uh, he knows that uh, both Revengers are, are, have been used, if I remember correctly, because we saw two of them yeah. earlier. There's none in the hand. And Despite wasn't developed, so that'd be the only activator for Grom. So sure, uh, that would have been a relatively safe turn to use it because I think he he would have been still like three damage off lethal just with the four damage from Grom. So, um, but you know, playing it safe, really thinking through his turns here. But he definitely looks super stressed. Yeah, doing some head massages. <laughs> I've been there, bro. I, yeah. I definitely can sense the tension coming out here, at least from Sogi's side. He's, it looks like he's going to try to get Demon Rat value now, play the Shredder. It's fine. It finally allows him to start tapping again, but he missed this opportunity last turn. And, you know, it feels like, you know, and I don't want to predict it too, I don't want to push it too much, but it feels like the wheels are starting to come off the jet here. Uh, sorry, the wheels are coming off the, the wagon. The jet? Oh. Sorry, the wheels are coming <laughs> off the, the, the wagon, and he needs to buy a jet. Because uh, right now, he's in the situation where He's losing tempo to the warrior, which is going to start developing a little bit more proactively. So now, anything he puts out, warrior can remove very aggressively, and yeah. then there's no real threat to follow it up. The, this Freena Warlock deck is only good at how many threats you can churn out against the warrior. Yeah. And he's getting, like, max value out of the Gorehow with two more death spikes to follow up. Yeah. It feels like Sogi's in a pretty awkward position, even though the game is still far from decided. He, he's lost board. Uh, he does have Twisting Nether, but that's his only board clear. There's an Ink Gang boss as well, which doesn't match uh, match up with a Shield Maiden. So now what he wants to see, and having to use that Twisting Nether now means that he gives complete uh, initiative over to Pinping Ho, and yeah. still doesn't have the best of plays going into next turn. Maybe he's, it'll allow him to save his major axis. He's used a lot of his mid-range minions. A Belcher, two Shield Maidens. I mean, the reality is, Pinping Ho doesn't have much to play after this. So yeah, that's true. I don't mind that play at all. It's a pretty good read, for, honestly, from Sogi. Pretty yeah. underrated play. Even though Mio's like, wow, Twisting Nether to kill one and a half minions after they've killed stuff from you already? Yeah. There we go. Now we're talking. Sogi gets the Emperor Thorstein off the top of his deck. That's great with Jaraxxus, too, because now you can hero power with it. One of the strongest My plays in the game is a reduced Jaraxxus. Yeah. Being able to play that hero power, getting us pretty much a free 6-6 six, six on the board, as well as that, that weapon. Power of almost certainly the go-to pick. You have Shadow Flame, so that gives you Almost guaranteed board clear based off the way Jaraxxus can interact. Yeah. Oh, Harrison Jones. Interesting. But as, as we talked about, Harrison Jones, using it against the Jaraxxus often means, well, well, sometimes means you discard. Often means uh, you get ahead of your fatigue, even if you're playing against a Warlock that's tapped a lot, because a lot of times you're getting six, seven cards. I wonder. The Harrison Jones. So it, it, it's a tough play to make in one face with Jaraxxus. Ping Ping Ho, really evaluating how he wants to remove this Emperor Thoris, and I think he doesn't want to part ways with his Execute. Oh, wow, he's using Grom? <laughs> what do you think about this, TJ? Now, that that's just oozing with value right there. He, he, It's not often that you get all the way down to one durability with Gorhal. Oh, yeah, I want I mean, do you do you like this attack by Grom sending out here as removal against Emperor Thorson? It, it means like he values execute over Grom Hellscream in this matchup, which seems odd to me. Cuz Grom a, Grom can so it, it means he, he's going to be focusing on like one win condition, and that win condition is pretty much going to be fatigue. That's exactly what the problem is, though, because now your opponent's played Jaraxxus. Maybe he wants him to, so that way he can play Harrison into it. Yeah. But I feel like you're going to be playing on borrowed time from this point on. But let's find out what happens here. Ping Ping Ho plays Harrison immediately without playing anything else. He's going to overdraw by a lot. Oh, wow. Is he going to discard... What was this, four cards? Oh, I would be so sad if he burns the oh monkey. God. There yes. goes the monkey! Goodbye, monkey. Why? <laughs> <laughs> Two shield slams down the drain. Flush him. <laughs> 
What just happened? He just I slammed am not the head. Yeah. I'm pissed. What now? Oh man, Peeping Ho, I think realizes it, you know maybe you play a little bit too hastily. Because well, you, you, first of all, you're you, like, wow, I have a lot of draws, and then you realize. Oh, I have too many. Cards. You didn't see the look of satisfaction on Pimping Ho's face when he played the Harrison. He knew exactly what he was doing, Dan. Let's dispel this fiction <laughs> that Pimping Ho did not know what museum he was going to. He yeah. knew exactly which one it was. Well, at least he got full value off his execute. I can I can hear what Pimping Ho is telling to himself in his head. He's like, okay, establish dominance. Overdraw the did. monkey. I mean, he is pressuring with being proactive on the board here, but that's about to change. Yeah. Uh, the moment that Sogi can build up a reasonable board, reasonable board with his hero power, it's going to be tough. Pimping Ho at least has two brawls, though. Game is not decided just yet, but that map to the Golden Monkey was so crucial. That was, it, it's so crucial because it replaces cards like Death Lord, which don't do anything really, against the pressure of 6-6s. Six you can replace them with legitimately big threats. Maybe even another Gromish Hell Scream or a way you can end the game in some capacity like that. So the win conditions are basically out the window now for Pimping Hill. Uh, he used Grom as removal, so he can't, you know, make a, a, a timing play with Grom, especially not after Draxxus is played. Even if he had the Grom, it, he'd have to get through Taunts as well, and that map is gone. So the, the other win condition of just overwhelming the Reno Warlock with Legendaries is, is out of the way, too. And he's behind in Fatigue. Yeah, this is... He's doomed. This is a... Well... I would say the biggest pro... Oh, no. He's doomed. All right, that's it. I, I think uh, Ping Ping Ho has to concede here. That's going to wrap it up. Definitely not the uh, the prettiest game, but you know what? In Soki's mind, we take those. Yeah. <laughs> we'll take anything we can. Yeah. Listen, Still, it doesn't matter if you win by an inch or a mile, TJ. A win is a win. Yeah, but as Pipping Ho said, it doesn't matter if you're the best. <laughs> you're still, you're still going to win BlizzCon. Look, uh, you know what? I, I think that was uh, a game that just kind of got a little bit too carried away if you're looking at Pink Pink Ho. Yeah. One of the really easy things in this matchup, which is already a little bit tougher from the Warlock's point of view uh, because of the the, the, in, like the the undulating waves of threats, is that you feel like you have to win fast. And in his mind, he's saying, if I can play Grom, uh, you know, maybe there's a situation where I can still win if I force him to play yeah. Harrison and draw a lot. But it was a lot of situations, too, where he was valuing certain cards and not valuing other cards and ended up paying a huge price for it. The brawl ended up not being fortunate, but by then, I still feel like the Warlock was in a great position because he still had Shadow Flame. Yeah. He still had both Taunt minions. He still has his access to hero power. And not to mention, he's in the worst-case scenario, if it goes to Fatigue, he still can heal with Reno Jackson and be able to stay alive in that situation. Uh, that Warlock game was just super one-sided the moment he decided to part ways with the Grom. Yeah, and then just exacerbated by the fact that he used the Harrison very hastily. Not even like getting rid of cards out of his hand, because at that point, even something like an Acolyte of Pain. Sure, is, which he kept in his hand for a long time. Yeah, it, it, it's completely useless after you get that far in your deck after you play Harrison. So uh, both players now, uh, Pimpico is going to have to reset. Sogi hopefully has a little bit more confidence after that last win. It, I'll, I'll take it. You know, in this case, Sogi, it, it hasn't been exactly the cleanest path to victory, but now he can go to Paladin versus Warrior, which, you know, in, in my opinion, I think this matchup's actually pretty dang good for the Paladin player. Yeah, it is. But there are things that you can do as a Warrior player, and there are key cards to look for in this matchup. Uh, I've talked about this matchup with uh, a lot of... Um, pro players in the Americas scene, uh, including Muzzy, who's, um, you know, floated, has finished top 10 legend like four months and four seasons in a row. Yep. Um, and he, he taught me these these strategies, a win condition, so to speak, against the Murloc Paladin. And that involves saving your Belchers and saving your Brawls until the very end of the game. And for the, after the first anything can happen is played, you play the first Brawl, you play the first Belcher. Then after the second anything happen is played, you play the second ball, you play the second belcher, and usually they don't have en enough damage to push through. Because you have so much life. Because you have so much life. There's a lot that happens in between. You, you sort of need to have just a car true heart in a timely fashion to start building up that armor. Uh, you need to not let the board get carried away with small things like tokens, 
peacekeepers. Right, which you, you know do the have, marks before they die, yeah. You do have access to those tools with revenge and weapons. Yeah. So I do feel like Peeping Ho has some of those tools. However, I think the other side of it could happen too, where if Sogi recognizes that, he can pressure Watch beforehand. Now. Yeah. Um, and one of the really annoying things about this matchup is that if you're the warrior player, you have to remove the war the Murlocs. You have to, you have to fire your war axe down the war leader. Yeah. Uh, and then that's what exactly what they want. Yeah. <laughs> I don't ask why I'm laughing. Oh, okay. I, I was because I felt like I was on the outside of an inside joke, TJ. An, in an inside joke with just me. <laughs> at least you. At least you're happy, TJ. Yeah. <laughs> You can I make am. yourself laugh, that's what's important. I this is a really powerful move from Ping Ping Ho. The fact that he can draw multiple cards is pretty huge. Um, card draw and control matchups is can be game deciding, because it just gets you deeper to the deck to be able to decide how much damage you can do to your opponent or how you can remove. So yeah. This is a great move from Ping Ping Ho. You're not too worried about fatiguing this matchup as the warrior player, just because even if you get three draws out of both of your Acolytes of Pain and play both of your shield blocks, the Murloc Paladin probably s is still going to be about even with you on draws. So Definitely. Uh, you're not going to get to a point where... Uh, you, you might, but it's, it's rare to get to a point where you lose because you drew too much and because of fatigue. And you need to get to that just, just a card True Heart. So the faster you can get there, the better this matchup's going to go for you. Okay, so he just methodically removing, but Pimping O going to be able to play at least Star Seeker here and just start fighting back onto the board. The, the reason of how good Star Seeker can be in this matchup, I'm not sure. Do, do you, can you think of like if at least Star Seeker is useful outside uh, just the taunt of the Golden Monkey? I don't think it's good. Um, just because you... Uh, it can be good if you ha if you are forced to use your belt earlier, but like you said, it, it's only good because of the taunt of the Monkey. But Belcher actually blocks more damage than Monkey especially later when anything can happen is played because it blocks two attacks. And those two attacks can be like 30 damage with old Merc guys, whereas sure. Golden Monkey only blocks one attack. So a lot of times you can't afford to play it because you need to hold on to your Belchers and you need to hold on to your Brawl. So uh, basically its function is just, you know, a 3-5 in the early game to, to fight for board and uh, maybe cycle later on uh, when, you, when you draw that Golden Monkey. So it, it, it's not that helpful in this match in particular. I believe it. Well, Sogi has two Belgers in his deck, which will be helpful to fight off all these small, annoying things from uh, the Warrior. But he's not lacking cards like Dr. Boom, which is the real punch of the deck. Yeah. He is uh, picking up threats, though, and the the Paladin hero power is just super strong against, you know, Warriors in general, maybe with the exception of, of Patron Warrior. Uh, What's the timing on the Doomsayer for Paladin this matchup? <laughs> I was thinking maybe Pal uh, Doomsayer would be good to allow yourself some breathing room of playing like a Belcher or something yeah. before it. And there, there's just never a, a super good timing because there's just not good enough threats to try and preempt. Uh, you can play before turn six to try and get the Shield Maiden, but a lot of times they'll just go ahead and play, play the Shield Maiden anyway if they were going to, just because they value the armor. Yeah, I guess that makes sense. Um, from Soki's point of view, he wants to set up the safest turn to play Lay on Hands and then eventually draw to his Murlocs. So this is fine. Getting value off the Peacekeeper while he can and then saving the Sludge Belcher for uh, after the weapon because the weapon challenges immediately. Mm -hmm. So Ping Ping Ho, what is he going to do? If he parts ways with the weapon, he can't really follow up with anything else besides the second Shield Maiden, which is okay, I guess. Yeah. I think you also want to kill the Murloc, because even though killing the Murloc, Murloc feeds into the anything can happen, There's it, also, en it ends up allowing you to buff other Murlocs, too. Yeah. There's also a high priority of, uh, especially from this point on, and using your natural armor up every turn. Because you need to start, once you establish board control, or even just board presence, you need to start building up that life total. Uh, just because, you know, that's part of your win condition in this matchup is getting out of range of the of the damage from anything can happen, even with Sludge Belchers. Oh, so he plays the Belcher straight into the Shield Maiden. And all of a sudden, Gorehouse looking like an opportunity to get some value here. Mighty fine. Still want to... Armor total means a lot. 
as I was pointing out. So, oh, so you want to play Despite and Armor Up instead? Yeah, I, and not use the Gore Howl to, you know, trade in. Because uh, you, you need to preserve that, that life, so. Uh, it's reasonable, although I guess... I guess the question just becomes, how do you use Gorhau later on? But I suppose if you just get the death by swings and use Gorhau to ride it all the way to the yeah, you can just later on you just equip Gorhau and use it as like a seven damage threat <laughs> later in the game. Sure, Gorhau and a Gromash. Yeah. Well, Pimpy Ho kind of picked this line. If he wants to equip Gorhau, he can still shut down a one-two slime. But death by seems to be the more preferable option based off the line he took. And that's fine, too. Fitting in those armor-ups. Well, this makes Sogi have an opportunity. Oh, Old Fur Guy's not bad, either. So now he can play Consecration and Fur Guy. Clear the board. I'm still waiting for him to play cards like the Lamp, though. So. Huh. You're not a big fan of that play, TJ? Uh, it... <laughs> It's probably not that big of a deal, but you know that shield maiden would have died uh, to the whirlwind effect of the despite anyway. Yeah, the damage to face isn't irrelevant, like you said. Yeah, just getting getting that armor off. I mean, there could be a situation where ten turns down the line, he's you know two damage off of lethal, and it's could be because he he didn't make the attack. Sure. With that old merc guy, but uh, just just small things. I'm trying to think why he would attack into that, and I, I guess just making sure that the board is clean has some inherent value, but not too much. And now Pimpy goes to apply some pressure. Huh? Hello. That is, a, that is a super aggressive attack. Now Sogi can really just be unafraid of anything. I mean, I guess Pimping Ho's idea is, look, he played Peacekeeper. Uh, he has to have humility or an equality. Yeah. He just happens to be able to have the equality here. <laughs> Once again, Pimping Ho. Just going with the weird play to assert dominance. I mean, in his mind, he says, this match is probably pretty awkward. And, yeah. You know, like, maybe this is an opportunity for me to be a regressor. But Sogi's going to heal back up to full as if nothing ever happened. Mm -hmm. Yeah. And I I mean, as I've said, you know, multiple times, just outright killing the Seek, or sorry, the Murloc Paladin is, is not the, the main win condition. Uh, it, it's just outlasting both anything's is outlasting their damage and eventually uh, the Murloc Paladin will run out of stuff and, and die from fatigue because they drew so much so uh, still no trust card true heart though and we, we've been through quite a large portion of the deck so this is not what you want to see if you're the control warrior player Pimmy Hill probably a little bit annoyed that he hasn't seen that a little a, a bit earlier I mean, it's okay, because in the in the end, the warrior, this is a removal warrior, so Grom Hellscream can be considered as removal. So I, I wouldn't be the most upset if it ends up being the case where he just, his, he's on the plane of saying, like, yeah, Grom's just a eight damage, absorb a removal, and kill off his minions on the board. Yeah. But he also didn't use it as removal. That was the thing. He, he just attacked... <laughs> face with it to try to rush him down. That was the only question mark that I had. I don't have a problem playing Grom there. He used it to remove some cards from Sogi's hand the next turn. He used it to remove 10 damage to the face. Exactly. Well, that feeling when you play an antique heal bot for zero value, uh, it's still okay because Sogi just wants to get the armor count down. Anytime yeah. the weapon uses the swing, and reduce it from the double digits to single digits, you're still feeling pretty good as Sogi. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Just applying that pressure where you can. Feels pretty irrelevant just because you know that <laughs> the warrior's not going to be applying pressure anytime soon. Uh, we saw the card counts a little bit earlier. Uh, now at this point, it's going to be uh, uh, 12 cards for Pimping Hill, I believe, and, and uh, seven now for Sogi. So I mean, Pimping Hill is still waiting for a chance to get value off Harrison Jones. He's even considering SQ. This is how much he's valuing the armor on his uh, on his life total. He's willing to part ways with Execute. I mean, he's committed to this play. Yeah. I didn't think it was that threatening of a board, but I mean, in his mind, he really needs it. Yeah, and you really can't afford to use those brawls early on. Because you need those brawls for the anything. Because that, that first anything's played, you play the first brawl, and then the second one's played, you need some way to remove those Murlocs off the board, because you can't use single target removal to get rid of them all. You have to have those two brawls. 
So getting further in the deck now is Sogi. Yep, I think he's missing one more murder lead, war leader, and that's it. He also needs to get it second anything can happen. He needs to chain them. Yeah. Well, he's only got like five cards left in the deck, so. Maybe even less. Yeah. It looks Four? less. Four cards, yeah. So there's an anything can happen. There's a war leader. And true silver champions? Mm. One true silver champion sure. and perhaps something else. I'm not sure if we saw two in the match earlier that he played in the Murloc Paladin Mirror. Uh, I would assume it's two. You're playing a control style deck, so you yeah. definitely need the weapon to hit the board. I think from Sogi's point of view, he can he doesn't want to even draw too much more. Normally you play like an act right here, but I think he feels like I have to play a little bit slower. Yeah. Not try to draw so fast. Pipping Ho, he has a Belcher. And does that mean he's gonna play the Belcher? According to TJ, you don't play the Belcher. You don't. This would be a complete understanding of how to play this matchup. Ooh, look at Ping Ping Ho. He knows, man. He's on to it. Smart man. And he's even got the Harrison ready for the True Silver Champion. Which is pretty big, because then he can finally develop a minion on board. Yeah. Yeah. You can play the, uh, the one Sludge Belcher when you have the second one, as long as you're confident that your opponent mm. can't remove it and then play uh, anything can happen. So uh, he, he definitely has a lot of experience with this matchup. I mean, he's playing Control War. He's also playing Murloc Paladin. So uh, he knows what he doesn't want to see right. from the other side of the matchup. He knows how he loses it as the Murloc Paladin. So I love it. Let's All see. right. Well, time to put another weapon into the museum. Harrison Jones. Picking up a bash, which isn't the yeah. most useful. But you know what? He's got so many weapon charges. I think Pimping Ho is just going to get to work here. Yeah. Back to the grind. I, I just don't think Pimping Ho has gained enough armor here. I don't think he's gained enough life uh, to be able to survive right. the onslaught of Murlocs that is surely to come. I and believe he... uh, the maximum... How, I think the maximum damage is a cut below 50 for a full board, assuming yeah. you can hit all to the face. Yeah. Uh, if it if two is interrupted by uh, the Sludge Belcher, how much max damage can you get, assuming the Palin gets to choose every single Murloc? Ooh. Is it in the 30s? I just know that I don't really feel safe until I'm at, like, 90 health. Mm. Okay. That's a little bit excessive. 90 health, DJ. <laughs> Uh, come back to me Look, about three times as much as you start off in the game. Come back to me in about 12 minutes, and I'll have an answer for you, Dan. I'm gonna get working on my math here. Sure, sure. 12 plus. I'm just kidding. I'm not even gonna do it. Well, Gorhal does override quite con... it. Yeah, and he's it gonna kill off. Quite just conveniently gonna hold on takes to out it. Doomsayer. That was a <laughs> Oh, well, there's the I am second a little bit confused. Happen. That is 22 damage. And yeah, I think Ho has to brawl and play Belcher. Just, I, I still just don't think he has enough. Because he also, keep in mind, has to kill the last Murloc that, uh, that's played. Well, he doesn't have to. Right. Uh, but I just don't think it's going to be enough. Uh, you, even though he played it pretty intelligently by holding on to the okay. Belcher, holding on to the brawl, you, you still have to gain enough health earlier on. There's no way he can't get away without playing Belcher here. Um, he's 100% dead. Yeah. He does not. I, I think he's 100% dead either way. Yeah, because it feels like if you just hit with the two Merc eyes, he's dead. I think in the scenario where you get four War, four leaders, war leaders and three Blue Gills, you actually survive. That's, it's unlikely, though. It's very unlikely. Because two blue gills have to go in, and the last blue gill can't do it. So there is a chance that Soki's anything can happen, it can just completely whiff. Yeah. And if so it ends up having that, no Merc Eyes. No so Merc Eyes is the key. Soki's going to think about it. Here we go. There's no other option. Oh. What? It happened. <laughs> it happened. He didn't get it. Baby Ho. What the heck? How did you do that? What are the odds? Soki, this is not your series, brother. Oh my goodness. That is a second brawl in hand, too. The, the thing is, it, it, it's, not, it's not over yet. Because <laughs> he still has True Server Champion that he can take over two turns, but... Yeah, he's got Death Lord, and he can't get past Death Lord. Yeah, and he's fatiguing now, so it's only a matter of time. The Bash is going to come out. It's Soki oh can't help but shake his head. That's the only outcome.
I, I told you it could happen. The only one. Did you believe me, TJ? Soaking can't believe it. Oh my goodness. He's gonna try and play two silver and push, but he's gonna realize he's gonna get met by the great wall of death lords. And uh, you know, to add insult to injury, yeah, you know, there was no Justin Card True Heart being played this game. None. None. Uh, you know, Peeping Ho definitely didn't have a very proactive hand. He had he even overrid his own over he, he was overriding his own fiery war axe to get to this point. Yeah. And uh, uh, two of the victory. Oh, and he concedes, and that's Pimping Ho taking the series. What a match! Uh, Pimping Ho doesn't even know what to say. He's actually yeah. laughing at the face of his opponent. That is emoting IRL, yeah. to which uh, there's unfortunately no squelch option. Yeah. So he just has to sit there and <laughs> the, the, he's not even shaking his hand. He's just sitting there. He's like, what do I do? At each other from across. What a, what uh, a match, though. All right, there we got we go. the handshake. I guess the, the original Ping Ping Ho is the best Ping Ping Ho for today. <laughs> yes. Uh, but yeah, I mean, there was no Justicar, yep. not much armor gain. TJ, don't it's worry, really man. exciting stuff. We said plenty during the series. That was a long one. That was yeah. our final one. Ping Ping Ho is the last winner. Moving on to play the Japanese player, Matsun. Don't forget that Sogi will be playing against Naviut in the lower bracket tomorrow. No one's eliminated, but we'll see what happens in just a little under 20 hours. We have Doa standing by with our winner, Pimpin Ho from Taiwan. Hey guys, yep, I'm here with Pin Ping Ho. Man, that was an ordeal. That was a crazy match to win. I mean, obviously you're exhausted. It's the end of the night. How do you feel though? It's gotta feel good though to at least get the yeah, win. It feels good. Pretty good right now, but with some pretty lucky moments, and yeah, it feels great to win. I mean, you talked a lot of trash in your video, right? I mean, you there were some big words coming from you coming into this tournament. Were you worried at all during the match? Um, not really. It's like I think I'll win anyway. Okay, you're gonna win anyway. So I've got a question about your uh, warlock deck choice because we've seen a lot of zoo lock, we've seen a lot of arena lock, but you just brought hand lock. Do you feel like it's a superior way to play Warlock right now? Not really, but it's like part of my strategy. I don't want to reveal it right now. Ah, I see. No problem. Don't You don't need to. But part of your strategy I've got, uh, I, I'm thinking probably didn't involve a Murloc Paladin versus Murloc Paladin game. Like, how, how in the world do you approach that? Like, your, your mind turns to mush. Like, what do you think about during that game? Um, the board control was on his side, like, most of the games, like... It's actually pretty hard for me, and one of the key plays I made is like I play Brugger Warrior to prevent him from playing like a war leader and kill me mm. next turn. But he he actually got help out, and and I couldn't actually prevent him from killing me inside with a with a anything. But but he missed it though. Yeah. Okay, it was insane, wasn't it? Yes, it is. So. Going forward, I mean, uh, do you have any words to your future opponents now? I mean, you should have struck a little bit of fear into their hearts, but you want to strike a little bit more. Here's your chance. Mm, I don't think I need to. Okay. I think I'll just crush them. All right, well, there you go. I mean, uh, there it is from Pin Ping Ho. No more words are necessary. He's apparently just going to crush them. So let's go back to the sidebar where Papa Smithy and Kibler are standing by. Thanks very much, Doa and Kibla. How do we even follow up what was quite the series? I mean, it clocked in at just over an hour of Hearthstone. It didn't even go all five games, and we still went over an hour. First impressions, first reaction. I mean, that was that was just a crazy match. Like, there wasn't a single game there that that wasn't kind of outrageous in some fashion. So, pretty great way to close out the day. I mean, every single game went to turn ten. That lets you know what sort of a series we were in for. Oh, yeah. I mean, there's so many things that we could show you guys. I think the first replay, it's not truly a replay, but it gives you an idea of just what was going on. And it wasn't just the players in this situation. This is everyone on the side as well as we roll this first clip here. And this is just <laughs> watching Sogi doing this hand math. And it's not just him. Everybody at the sideline, I was seeing Doe, I was seeing you. Everyone's trying to work out the machinations because we saw so much Murloc Paladin. Yeah, there, there's so much that can happen in an anything can happen mirror that you need to keep track of so many things calculating, okay, these are all the Murlocs that have died. This is what each of them do. This is what all of it adds up to. And uh, it can be tough to keep track of. And of course, that 
plays into our first clip here when we're talking about keeping track of Murlocs. And there was catastrophic mistakes on both sides. And that was honestly the big story because we saw a lot of solid hearts on the first match. Demon Handlock versus the Murloc Paladin was played at a very high level. At the end of the day, the taunt wall was too high. Now we're going into game two and we're looking at this play. It's important to note that Soki had already used both his equalities and was obviously respecting the chip damage. Remember, Pimping Ho is playing the Kalento version with more of the mid-range minions, with the shield and mini bot and stuff. But talk me through what happens. Yeah, he, he just ends up, uh, you know, d doesn't need to actually get rid of this entire board and just sets up Pimping Ho to actually just kill him with his, uh, anything that happened on the backswing. He didn't quite calculate things correctly, didn't realize that he was just going to die there, apparently. I mean, the way I look at it, the one thing he didn't factor in, because remember, his Murlocs didn't die, mm. so you're thinking, okay, I'll be fine. Didn't factor in old Murkai. Old Murkai getting buffed by the full board of Murlocs was enough to create lethal, and... And it, we saw both these players calculating so much back and forth, and, and clearly just a, an absolutely exhausting series. You can understand how, in the end, after so much calculation, sometimes something just slips up. And we're going to have another example of that in a second, but you've played a lot of card games, Hearthstone included. Talk to me about fatigue, because it's very late here over in California. It was a very long series. Talk to me about the impacts of fatigue, because it was sin on both sides when we get into the second clip. I mean, it, it could be absolutely huge. Uh, there was actually traveling in particular, and these players, you know, not only traveled here, played the last match of the day, have played an incredibly long match. It can really take it out of you. you, you your mental acuity really declines after that period of time, and in particular when you're fighting jet lag and everything as well, it can be very, very difficult to really stay at the top of your game for that long. And that's why we'll load into our third replay, and it's important to show this just because the fatigue wasn't just on one side. Soki, by this game three, was already very visibly frustrated, of course, after that misplay. But we're getting into game three, and then it's clearly not just all about Sogi when it comes to the fatigue. Well, this is this is an interesting situation in a couple accounts. Sogi actually very heads up doesn't attack with his Jiraxis weapon because it means that a Harrison Jones from Pimping Ho will further overdraw him. And Pimping Ho, it seems, doesn't quite calculate the fact that, yeah, playing this Harrison Jones is going to draw eight cards and burns so many key cards from his deck. He didn't even play any cards from his hand prior to that. He could have at least played uh, played something from his hand so he would overdraw less. Yep. And it, it was possible he didn't actually even need to play Harrison Jones at that stage either. Perhaps wait, see if he does choose to attack with a weapon. So it definitely uh, ended up burning a lot of the key cards, those shield slams, the map to the golden monkey, which... I always wanted to see a monkey. So sad the only possible monkey we saw today ended up getting burned. It was at such a high armor total that the Shield Sams would have definitely been live. He had playable cards. I think he had five cards in hand. And then, of course, Drew 8, so had the three overdraw. But he had access to using his weapon. He could have played one of the taunt minions. So, again, you have to say fatigue is the big story because, again, swaths of this hour, you'd say at least... 55 minutes of the hour were very high-level Hearthstone in some of the most difficult and mechanically intensive matches that are possible. Yeah, I mean, th we saw a lot of really calculated plays from both players throughout most of the match, and it seemed you know, that, that the fatigue and the length of the match with so many control matches as well really just got to them. I mean, the meta, that's why we saw, I mean, just Murloc, double Murloc Paladin means that we're going to see the long games, both of them hunting control decks. So many control decks on the field. I do have to say that it's incredible that we've seen nothing but Murloc Paladin decks in this tournament. Not a single mysterious challenger to be seen. I mean, Every one Murloc Paladin before this week, a little bit of secret, a mid-range, an aggro, and now only Murloc Paladin. Yeah, really interesting to see. You know, who am I? Well, nowhere, apparently. So just, as a, just a final question. Is that just a reality of, you know, we all watched the finals from other regions. All these players, barring maybe UCCU, were touted as control players, and then Murloc Paladin sort of seen as his paragon of taking down control decks. Yeah, I think it is an, a uh, matter of just a different metagame uh, that these players are expecting. If you're expecting a large number of other control decks, a deck like Murloc Paladin is a very good foil to those strategies, uh, whereas something like Seeker Paladin, something like Midrange Paladin might not match up quite as well. After a long series, Pimpingo takes it down. He will be in the upper bracket tomorrow. Thank you very much for joining us, guys. And let's look at some highlights as we wrap up the broadcast.
Well, Dan, day one of the Asia Pacific Winter Championship is behind us, and what a day it was. Filled with Murlocs and tank up. Been great. Yeah, you know, I'm really pleasantly surprised again, not to rehash too much more, but I'm glad that the Asian metagame you can see has a clear difference uh, than what we've seen in, a in America's as well as Europe. Yeah, well, let's take a look at the brackets for the day, starting with Group A. Tomorrow we'll, we'll, we'll start it off, I think, with the elimination matches. So that's going to be Staz and UCCU, who both uh, fell down in their first matches. And, of course, Handsome Guy and Dao Huni are going to be fighting out for that winner spot to be first in their group, moving on to the playoff stage on Sunday. That's right. Korea is guaranteed a top four berth. Really nice job from them in Group A. In Group B, we have Matsu from Japan and Pimping Ho from Taiwan being able to move on to the winner's match. Group B, the lower match will be played by Naviut from Australia, and then Sogi, the lone Korean who didn't win his match today. But he's another chance tomorrow to go through all the way. And it'd be a cool story to see if he ends up going all the way to win the entire championship, despite starting off a little bit rocky. Yeah, tomorrow should be a great day. So let's take a look at what we are going to see for tomorrow. And uh, I believe I said earlier, we are going to start. Oh, we're going to start off over in the winner's bracket matches where we're going to see Handsome Guy and Dahuni and Matsun versus Pinping Ho. And then it's uh, it's winner go home for the players on the lower side of the bracket for Staz, UCCU, Naviut, and Sogi. Uh, lots on the line for them in their matches tomorrow. So at the end of tomorrow, we will be left with only six players competing for that spot at yep. the World Championship. That's right. Uh, so pretty much the same exact thing as you guys have been watching the previous weeks, but I, I, I think we've already conceded that we have a great collection, not only of decks, but also some personalities. I love getting to know these players a little bit more from the father who's wearing his daughter's shirt they made to give him the esports power, yeah. uh, all the way to Pimping Ho, who's just basically styling on people <laughs> in, in, in the most uh, awesome way possible. I really love what we have in store. I can't wait for tomorrow, TJ. Yeah, I can't wait for tomorrow. I can't wait for the rest of the weekend as well. And keep in mind, we will be revealing that Whispers of the Old God card at the end of the weekend. So thanks, everybody, for watching. We will be uh, returning tomorrow, same time, same place. So from everybody here at the Hearthstone Championship Tour broadcast, thanks for watching. We'll see you tomorrow.